In his first speech after the Union victory, Lincoln alluded to the enormous challenges Reconstruction would bring. He even suggested that some black men in the South might get the vote. His words infuriated many, including a Confederate sympathizer who assassinated the president three days later. With Lincoln gone, the question of how to put the country back together again took on even greater urgency. Northerners were exhausted by four years of war. Most had hoped Lincoln would reconcile North and South and get the states back to normal relations as soon as possible. But there was no consensus on how to achieve this. Just as uncertain was the future of millions of black men and women freed into a society where many whites, North and South, question the idea of any rights for former slaves. The notion of civil rights for blacks was revolutionary. 19th century Americans' whole notion of what it meant to be an American was all wrapped up in whiteness. An American was a person with white skin. Here you have the great questions of Reconstruction immediately are what people faced. Who will rule in the South? Who will rule in the federal government? And what will the dimensions of black freedom be? All eyes looked to Washington. Former Confederates held their breath and steeled themselves for the worst. The South doesn't know what to expect. Will there be punishment for leaders? Will there be land confiscated? Will there be an occupying army? And a lot of people imagine that these traitors, these people who have tried to destroy the United States, should be executed, should be imprisoned. No one was sure what to expect from the new president. Andrew Johnson was from Tennessee, but he had fiercely opposed the Confederate secession and was the only Southern senator who refused to give up his seat in Congress. Andrew Johnson embodies a lot of the hopes that Abraham Lincoln has that the Union can be put back together easily. But Andrew Johnson had been an outspoken enemy of the big planners who he blamed for causing secession. In Tennessee politics, he saw himself as a spokesman for the poor whites. He owned a slave or two, but he was not a member of the plantation aristocracy. In fact, he resented them very much. In his first speech after taking office, Johnson warned that traitors had to be punished. But Johnson shared the white South's desire to keep blacks subordinate. Frederick Douglass, the renowned black leader, got his own impression of Johnson when the two met for the first time at Lincoln's second inaugural. The very first expression that came over Johnson's face was one of scorn and derision. And Douglass concluded that that expression was the true index of his heart. Douglass turned to a companion and said, whatever else this man may be, he is no friend of our race. For the first 48 days of Andrew Johnson's presidency, Southerners waited anxiously to hear what he would demand before allowing them back into the Union. On May 29, 1865, Johnson announced his plan for what would be called presidential reconstruction. There was good evidence in 1865 that a lot of white Southerners, the leadership even of the Confederacy, would have accepted relatively harsh policies at that moment. But very soon it became clear that Andrew Johnson wanted a rapid, lenient restoration of the Union with as little alteration of the Constitution and the creation of black civil and political rights as possible. 
Johnson would issue blanket pardons for most former Confederates. The rebel states would be encouraged to form new governments quickly. Washington would not interfere. The president's leniency surprised many in the North. Southerners responded with relief. Johnson actually sets only the most minimal requirements. All they have to do is admit we lost the Civil War. The Civil War is over. Slavery and secession are dead. Other than that, there are no requirements. Johnson was harder on the planter aristocracy. He insisted that wealthy planters and Confederate leaders write him personally and beg for clemency. This basically eliminates the planter class from leadership of Southern politics. If you're not pardoned, you can't vote, you can't hold office, and you can't get your property back if it's been seized by the federal government. Andrew Johnson had no sympathy for wealthy planters. He had risen from poverty and identified with poor white Southerners who, before the war, had far outnumbered the slave owners. Now, he was anxious to protect poor whites from what they saw as a new threat. Poor whites have to face the fact that now that black people are free means that they have to compete with this new element for livelihoods, for social positions, and for political power, ultimately. And this is a very frightening thing. Johnson's aim is to bring the white South and the white North back together. African Americans just do not play a role in Johnson's vision of the post-war South, other than to go back to work and be landless and rightless plantation laborers. Johnson's contempt for the freedmen infuriated many in Washington, and none more than Thaddeus Stevens. The congressman from Pennsylvania had been a fierce abolitionist long before the war. Within the Republican Party, he led a small, vocal faction known as the Radicals. These were principled men. Before the war, they had been the strongest Republicans opposing the expansion of slavery. During the Civil War, they had been the first ones to call for arming of black troops, for issuing an emancipation proclamation. Long before there was any conceivable political benefit to be gained from supporting the rights of black people, they were doing it. The radical Republicans had a vision of what Reconstruction should be. They believed it should be longer in duration. They believed the Southern states had left the Union and had destroyed their status as states. They had to be reinvented. To Thaddeus Stevens, Reconstruction meant not only safeguarding and preserving the essential results of the Civil War, but in his vision, it meant remaking the South. It meant the increase of democracy in terms of representation. It meant the spread of the right of suffrage. The radicals' hard line marginalized them within their own party. Most Republicans feared the radicals' position on black rights would drive away white voters in the North. It is the radical wing which is the most sympathetic to black people. The party in general was committed to a limited program of civil rights, protection of property, education, etc. But the party is not in any way committed to any sort of radical restructuring of Southern society. Johnson's Reconstruction Plan could not be challenged until Congress convened in December. That summer, radical leaders could only watch as scores of planters descended on Washington, pleading to be pardoned. Whose petition would be denied or granted was uncertain. Still, former Confederates were hopeful. White men alone 
President Johnson told one senator, must manage the South. <laughs>